information as to what made the council determine, even absent the knowledge that uh, uh, Sheikh Omar was on the, the, the watch list, uh, that uh, he had sufficient ties to return back home uh, when he applied for this visa? Uh, I do not. Uh, I could only, I, I'd rather not speculate, uh, but I would presume that there were some indications of ties to Egypt and to Sudan. Uh, that justified, in the case of uh, the Sheikh, the assumption that he was merely coming to the United States temporarily. That, uh, in the case of the Sheikh, uh, probably would have been the lesser consideration. Certainly the reason for denying the visa was primarily because he was on our watch list. Uh, how long was this visa valid for? Uh, I believe it was valid for, it was an ordinary multiple entry visa, so therefore it would have been valid for several years. Uh, was there any cable traffic between the embassy in Khartoum and the department in Washington on this matter? I'm not aware of any, but I believe there was communication between Embassy Khartoum and Embassy Cairo before the visa was issued. Now, what type of passport was the Sheikh traveling on? A Sudanese passport or an Egyptian passport? I believe Egyptian. Um, the department in Washington, did the Department of Washington have any knowledge whatsoever about uh, uh, Sheikh Omar applying for this tourist visa? I do not, I, we have no record that, 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 that there was such a uh, communication back to the department in advance of issuing the visa. Do you know what percentage of the tourist visa applications in Khartoum are rejected? No, but I can get that for you. I do have uh, that objection. We'll hold the yeah. record open. Right. Okay. Records that uh, worldwide, uh, in which 20 to 25 percent of uh, non-immigrant visa applicants are rejected. Well, there's there's some countries it, where the rejection right. rate is over 90 percent. I uh, was in Colombia, where the rejection rate was a lot higher than 25 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, I would assume that in various countries, particularly such as Sudan, the Middle East, the rejection rate is probably higher. I'll get that information for you. Well, I. You know, I, what I'm wondering is, you know, I can understand how something would fall through the cracks uh, uh, with transliteration of names from the Arabic, uh, particularly before uh, the automated uh, check system was, was put in place, which was when this visa was applied for and issued. Right. Uh, what I can't understand uh, is, given what I suspect to be a huge rejection rate of tourist visas uh, uh, coming from Sudan and other Middle Eastern countries, uh, why uh, the council in Khartoum uh, viewed this application to be so special that uh, uh, the Sheik did overcome the presumption that is statutorily applied to everybody who applies for tourist visas and he got one. I agree, Congressman. Uh, I simply do not know the, the, the reasoning that went, in, uh, went in behind that issuing of that no. visa. Well, I, obviously something fell through the cracks here. Uh, Clearly. Uh, and uh, I hope the crack has become narrower rather than wider. And one of the assurances that I think this subcommittee uh, would like is uh, other people in similar situations would not fall through the cracks and take advantage of our immigration laws. I think you can be sure that uh, not just this case, but a, a number of other cases where there, there have been errors, when we're dealing, let me point out, with uh, 5.3 million uh, immigrant visas being uh, issued every year. Uh, over 6.9 million applications, 7 million virtually applications for visas uh, are made at our embassies overseas every year. The presumption as a result of law and regulation is uh, that uh, people should be granted visas unless there are specific reasons for denying them. And those are rather carefully drawn and strictly drawn. As a result of dealing with such a huge volume of visas uh, over a very uh, extended period of time, and their validity in many cases is, uh, is for many years, there are mistakes made. And this was one of them. You know, on the other hand, anybody who applies for a non-immigrant visa has to overcome the statutory presumption that they are an intending immigrant. That is I think correct. every one of my colleagues here has a whole file drawer full of cases in their local offices uh, of people whose relatives have been denied tourist visas to come to see family in the United States 
because they were unable to overcome that presumption of intending immigrancy. Um, and uh, again, I think that uh, the subcommittee in the Congress needs an answer on, you know, uh, how this specific applicant was able to, able to overcome that, uh, forgetting completely about the fact that he was on the watch list. I thank the chairman and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Sessions, in a recent newspaper article, it, it was said that uh, the FBI reduced its anti-terrorism squads at the end of the Cold War, and, and there was a hit of criticism in that. Is that true? Uh, back in January 1992, I took and, uh, and transferred from foreign counterintelligence some 300 agents and some 25 uh, from terrorism taskings. And I did that uh, at that time and announced that reprogram at that time. That is correct. Um, and Director Sessions, they're, they're, they're clearly what must have been uh, leaks uh, in the New York incident, and I'm not going to ask who, who did it, but uh, the question I would ask you and Mr. Fox and any others are, are you looking into that and trying to find out who was responsible for leaking matters to the press? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, pardon me, uh, Congressman, it's a, it's a continuing matter of concern. This chairman uh, has no objection if you call my senior friend and colleague, Mr. Chairman, as well. He is. I'm accustomed to dealing <laughs> with him that way. Right. Uh, I thank, uh, I thank uh, my chairman. <laughs> the concern that everybody at this table has is always the same. Yeah. That is that we not somehow impair our ability to continue our investigation or to present our product to a United States attorney for presentation to a grand jury by somebody talking about various things. Uh, Mr. Higgins and I, sitting here, Director Higgins and I, have discussed uh, the issuance again of a joint statement that would uh, caution our people and remind all of our people over whom we have control uh, that it's absolutely essential that in a, a case of this magnitude that they, they take great pride in what they're doing and be sure that these matters are handled totally within the guidelines, totally within the professional requirements so that we do not have leaks. Leaks are very difficult to deal with. We have tried in each instance where we have found them to track them back, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as the Chairman said at the beginning of this, this hearing, this hearing is as much or more Or to examine the general situation with respect to terrorism, terrorist, terrorist vulnerability in this country, as it is this, this particular uh, tragedy that we are examining in New York. With that in mind, I'd, I'd like to uh, turn to Mr. <coughs> McNamara uh, and ask your, your uh, and again admonishing that you may decline to answer a question if you feel for some reason it should not be answered at this time. But I'd like to ask, generally speaking, is there a, um, a concern about uh, the, the, the possible existence of terrorism, or I should say the, the uh, planned um, um, happening of terrorism in this country fostered by foreign governments as a realistic uh, contemporary concern of the Department of State right now? Yes, certainly. Let me begin by maybe commenting on one of the earlier questions which is directly related to this one, that is, why has there been so little international terrorism in the United States? There are a number of reasons for that, I believe. First of all, because we have, as I said in my opening statement, a well-developed, well-coordinated counterterrorism effort on the part of the U.S. government. I've been associated over the course of my career with a number of interagency efforts on a number of issues, ranging from arms control to bilateral relations with various countries. I have never seen, nor have I ever uh, been uh, heard about even, or been associated with an interagency effort that has been so well coordinated and so absent, uh, so, so uh, lacking in turf battles and, uh, and, uh, and petty jealousies, as in the case of the counterterrorism community. I think it's a paragon of how interagency coordination ought to work. That is a, a big reason why there is uh, so little uh, terrorism, uh, international terrorism, uh, here in the United States. 
we do have a well-developed counterterrorism effort. Second reason is geography. We are relatively far away from the area where the terrorists are at home and do most of their activities. A third reason is that the United States, unfortunately, offers a lot of easy targets abroad, and the terrorists, therefore, choose those rather than coming here to the United States. We have more Americans traveling overseas. We have more embassies. We have more American businessmen. We have more American uh, corporations and industries overseas than any other country, and therefore, they are targeted. And we hear continually about targets. We are the most targeted country and our citizens and our interests and our corporations are the most targeted of any country in the world. But it is done overseas because it's easier. Another, the last two reasons I would give, one is, and they're related, one is that there is in the United States an absence of alienated, isolated foreign communities. And I think this is a tribute to our society and to the way we're organized in the United States. When foreigners come here, they come to be integrated into the society. They tend, as opposed to foreigners going... ...for example, into other countries of the world, they tend to come here with the intention of leaving behind the politics and the violence and some of the, uh, the problems that they had in the, uh, in the old country. They come here to integrate, to raise families, and to become Americans. And that means, therefore, that the foreign terrorist coming to the United States does not have that fertile ground where he or she can operate relatively free from interference because they're being protected by some small community or society. And the final reason, I think, is the political stability and a responsive democratic government in this country. The the issues, the problems of overseas uh, terrorism is much less relevant to the lives of the foreign community, uh, which is looking to, in most cases, to become citizens and resi permanent residents of the United States. They come here uh, to participate in that and not to destroy it. Those, I think, uh, and those last two are of extraordinary uh, importance in trying to understand why there's so little foreign terrorism here in the United States. That said, uh, we at the State Department, as I said, specialize in international terrorism. We leave to the FBI and the others the questions of domestic terrorism. There is uh, m many, many hours devoted by many embassies around the world to examining, collecting intelligence, collecting information, trying to work and cooperate with uh, all sorts of governments, some of whom we're not all that delighted to have to work with, uh, but nonetheless, uh, they're willing to cooperate with us in counterterrorism activities. And we do, to the best of our ability, mold and, 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 uh, and foster that type of cooperation that, in my opinion, has been one of the major reasons why we have been able to keep the, ter the foreign terrorists out of the United States. Our defense begins many thousand miles away, long before the terrorist ever gets off the plane at JFK or some other airport or slips across the border from Canada or Mexico. And that long-range defense has been an enormous asset over the years. That has helped to bring down those figures that you see on those charts. And when you combine that with the well-developed counterterrorism effort on the part of the FBI and other law enforcement here in the United States, I think that, it, that helps to explain. Can I ask, if I may? May have a moment, Mr. Chairman, to ask one follow-up question, Mr. McNamara. I appreciate that, but uh, I would like to ask, in the opinion of the Department of State, are there governments at the other end of that, uh, under the end, of, other end of that chain? In other words, are we looking at the possibility that some foreign government or governments, not simply residents of their countries, may desire to cause terrorist incidents in the United States to the extent that we can have a concern about it? Yes. State-sponsored terrorism in the last decade 
has been the most serious problem